This morning we established from the Word of God that one who's to be involved in preaching the Word is also a teacher, is also an evangelist. Notice in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, we read in verse 2 that we're to preach the Word as Timothy is. Verse 5, that he is to do the work of an evangelist. He's to be involved in doing that. Paul says that he is uh, not only a preacher, but he's a teacher in faith and truth as far as the Gentiles are concerned. Chapter 2 and verse 7. So preaching, proclaiming the word, ringing out the message. It's a wonderful song that depicts what we do to, to proclaim, to herald that wonderful message of those in doubt, those in sin, those who need their salvation. And what we observe from God's word is that that's the work of all Christians, but especially is it something that we're to be doing as a preacher and a teacher and an evangelist. This evening we're going to look into the ministry because Paul says fulfill your ministry. That is being a servant. That is involved in serving in connection with the word. It's serving God. It's serving our brethren. And we're going to see what that ministry looks like. We already know it's involved in preaching the gospel, the good news to save people from sin. We already know that it's to be involved in proclaiming that word. And it's the idea of teaching it. And we're going to see how Paul leaves two men, one on the island of Crete and one in Ephesus, in a locality. They're going to be teaching brethren. They're going to be teaching Christians that we'll observe tonight. That's part of the ministry that takes place with a proclaimer of the word of God. The first thing we notice about this preacher, he's a commander. He's a commander. He commands things. And we'll notice in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 7, you may not like the idea where he's going to be commanding things, but he's going to talk about family responsibilities. You might want to stay away from that if you're a preacher. Not if you're a preacher of God's word. Paul says in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 7, when he speaks about what... Timothy needs to be doing these things also command that they may be without reproach please note who the they are in this context oh if we see if if any widow have children or grandchildren so we're not talking about the widow verse 5 there is a widow that's not living the way she should she now she that is as a widow indeed in verse 5 then we'll see that verse 6 that widow she that does not live right got she 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 that wouldn't be they but i think one of the things he's commanding is what about the children what about the grandchildren when they if any man if any widow have children or grandchildren let them learn to show piety towards their own family and to requite their parents for this is acceptable in the sight of God. These things also command that they may be without reproach. Yeah, the widow that's given herself to pleasure, she needs to hear the command of God. She's dead while she lives. And yes, the widow that is indeed, she needs to have hope. But to be without reproach, is dealing with children and grandchildren that have a responsibility toward their parents. And Timothy is to get involved with that. To speak about that and command it. Now you see why it's important to preach the word? Because who gives you authority, young Timothy, to talk about children and grandchildren? You don't have any, do you? To talk about family responsibilities when you maybe hadn't lived long enough to understand what's all involved. See, you command from the standpoint of the word. He's a preacher of the word. 
The word is the word of God. God's commanding it. And Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, you're a preacher, but you're a commander. You are command these things. Even these difficult things sometimes. With children meeting their responsibilities. With their own family. Well, what about money? Oh, don't go there, preacher. Yeah, that's where the preacher of God goes. In fact, in 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, in verses 17 through 19, charge them that are rich in this present world. That word charge is a noting commandment. Charge them rich in this present world, that they be not high-minded, nor have their hopes set on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, that they be ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on the life which is life indeed. See, he's teaching too. But he's involved in charging them to don't be high-minded because they have a lot of money. They have a lot of possessions. Don't you do that. In this context, he's dealt with those who love to be rich and set forth that they can fall away from the faith to realize that here's how you're involved and how your relationship to money is involved. It's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. And so you charge them. Those who are rich, not to give up all the riches, but use it. It's how to use your money. It's not allowing money to make something out of you that you're not. You're going to leave it behind. And it can cause you to not lay hold on eternal life. That's, that's why the word is being preached. The peering of the Lord and the glory of his rule. Don't want that to be too late in your life. You don't want to fall away from, from that. And what is amazing to me and interesting that in the area of commandment, of giving charge, of what Timothy was to teach, are two areas that sometimes can be very difficult to talk about. In areas where a lot of people have their opinions. Areas where a lot of people don't want to go there. And the reason a young man Preaching can go there. It's because he's the preacher of the word. He's got God behind him. And he's got some teaching to offer the brethren there. So he is a preacher, but he is a commander. He's also a reprover, a rebuker, and an exhorter. Reprove means I'm going to convict them in their minds about what the truth is and probably what their error is. Rebuke is that I'm going to say that's wrong. <laughs> I got that in quotation marks because I don't think that's a word. But it's my sermon, rebuker, reprover. He's an exhorter. How could all three get together? You know, to where to be reproved, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. It's what Paul says in 2 Timothy 4. It's interesting where all three are needed on occasion. And that was dealing with slave issues. There needed to be rebuke and reproof to hit the conscience and to exhort. To encourage, to encourage people along their way. Turn with me to Titus, the second chapter. Paul says in verse 15, These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Why? Because you've got the commandment of God behind you. You have the authority, not because it's you, Timothy. It's because you're a preacher of the word. What things in this context... That he's been to speak about and to exhort and reprove. 
What has he been talking about? Verse 9 and 10 picks up, and some of the translations have ex included in verse 9, exhort servants, exhort slaves to be in subjection to their own masters and to be well-pleasing to them in all things, not gainsaying. I might want to kind of convict them. There may be some fellows that are just working when they're being looked upon. They may be gainsaying. They may be trying to say, well, when the master sees me, that's when I'll work. But they might need to be a, rebuked a little bit. That may be what they're doing. Paul warns that in Ephesians, that is an easy way to go, but not for the Christian. And the Christian slave needed to be taught. And there was reproof and rebuke. Not purloining, not stealing from the master. You can't do that. Maybe they needed to be rebuked because maybe they've been doing that. They needed to be reproved because if they thought about doing that, it needs to hit them in their conscience. Oh, but listen to the exhortation. That they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. He tells them about the grace of God that has been given. And the fact of verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. That he gave himself for us. That we be a people for his own possession. Look, dear Christian slave. Here in your circumstances, you can beautify you can adorn, he says, I have put up the doctrine of God. And by wearing it, by not stealing, and by not just working when they're looking, you can beautify the doctrine of Christ. They can see it being worn. One of the best illustrations I had, I remember that watching the different reruns of Andy Griffith. And one day, his aunt has gone to Hollywood and she won a fur coat. Back then, fur coats were okay. It was pretty special to have a fur coat. And everybody in Mayberry got word that she won it. And they were, they were happy for her. But when she came back to Mayberry, she had it on. And that made a difference. They didn't like and be wearing that fur coat. It's one thing to say, well, you want another thing, you're wearing it. And when people were adorning the doctrine of Christ, when they were wearing it and beautifying that, it makes a difference. And there may have been a little reproof because he says, you speak and reprove with all authority. They may have needed to have that information, but they needed to be encouraged with the exhortation. This is the route to go. Heaven is waiting for us. I know these are hard circumstances being a slave. It's waiting for us. The grace of God has come. And this is how you're supposed to live. Another difficult area for a preacher. But that's where it goes. In his teaching of the word of God. 1 Timothy the 6th chapter. You know Titus was not the only evangelist. He was not the only preacher. Timothy is told this. In verse chapter 6 and verse 1. He said let as many as are servants under the yoke. Their own masters worthy of all honor. That the name of God and the doctrine be not blasphemed. Let as many as are servants under the yoke. Count their own masters worthy of all honor. I honor them. They're worthy of that. And they that have believing, oh, you mean I'm supposed to honor the master that's not a Christian? Yes. Not saying these are wonderful circumstances. This is how you're going to live in those circumstances, dear Christian. And you're supposed to now honor the believing masters. Let them not despise them because they are brethren. 
but let them serve them rather, because they that partake of the benefit are believing and beloved. These things teach and exhort you teacher, preacher, evangelist, minister. You teach it. And you exhort it. That brother that you're working for, he's a believer. See, we're children of God. Difficult times, difficult circumstances. But he says, you even serve that believing master. And you honor, I don't care what master, if he's a member of the church or not, you honor him. And you serve him. You don't steal from him. You don't work just because he's looking. That's a Christian. That's adornment. That makes a difference. Even in our country, I read when the men were beginning to preach the gospel here, talk about the, the restoration movement. I read accounts where the differences of the races were there, very much so. And, but in the church, when they come to services, maybe the slaves, they weren't able to, to sit on the front seat. They had to sit in the back, you know. But when the gospel was preached, there's an occasion where the master became a Christian. And all of the slaves that worked for him were back there on the back seat clapping and happy that their master had become a Christian. I wonder, I wonder why he became one. Maybe there's some slaves doing this. Living like a Christian. And I wonder where they'd ever get it if it weren't for the preacher. He's a reprover. He's a rebuker. He's an encourager. <coughs> exhorter. And yes, he has to deal with difficult circumstances. He's a reminder. In 1 Timothy the 4th chapter... In verse 6 and 7, there's some things that need to be put before the people. And Timothy was to be involved in doing this. If thou put the brethren in mind of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Christ. So that's what we're talking about. What's your ministry like? Put them in mind of these things. You'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished in the words of the faith, that message of the gospel, that word of the gospel is created in words that bring forth the message. It is the faith. When Paul says there's no other gospel to preach in Galatians 1 and verse 8, verse 23, preach the faith. We're talking about the same word here. Yeah, they all go together. And of the good doctrine which thou hast fallen to now. Yes, we saw that the word is the foundation for the sound doctrine of Christ. Yes, he's going to the right source. He's now taking what needs to be set forth in the minds of people. He is a good minister. He's nourished in the faith. And he's dealing with what? If you remind me, he's dealing with doctrinal issues. And what these things are referring to is what starts back in chapter 4 and verse 1. And you may think that this is not a real big deal. Somebody's saying you can't marry. Somebody's saying you can't eat meats. Why do we have to make a big deal out of that? You don't have to marry. But no, you can't marry. They got a little teaching not like that. And you're going to have to be involved in, in not eating meats. Is that a big deal? Yes, it's a big deal with God. How do you know? Well, the Spirit saith expressly that some will fall away from the faith. Giving heed to seducing spirits. Seducing spirits, how bad are their doctrines of demons? The spirits are teaching things that demons teach <laughs> through the hypocrisy of men they're speaking lies 
They are branded in their own consciousness with a hard iron. I can't get through to them any longer. They have to, their mind is, is set and, and, and kind of hot iron seared. So they don't mind telling a lie, teaching the doctrine of demons. What is it? Don't marry, forbidding marriage and the eating of meats. Forbidding to marry in verse 3. Commanding to abstain from meats. That's what he says. You remind them of these things. That's how serious it is. And now tell me what I need to know, Paul. Tell me what is the, the doctrine that is I need to set forth before them. Well, we read here, he says here, For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be rejected, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified, remember what the word does, the word sanctifies us. The, it, is, the, it is sanctified through the word of God and prayer. All of creation is there to be received. You can eat meats. And you can give God thanks in prayer for those, those meats. And knowing that the word of God has sanctified it, saying it's okay. There's the sound doctrine that the preacher needs to do for his ministry. And when things are contrary to the faith, it is serious with God. I don't care what form it takes. Marriage, meats. Why well, get all bent out of shape out of that? is because it's contrary to the teachings of God. And a preacher that's not sensitive about doctrinal issues, you don't want it. Because he's not the man of God. God said this is serious. And you be involved in reminding them of these things. Because the word is the foundation for the sound doctrine. And what happens is a lot of times, and look how holy I am. I'm going to abstain from marriage, that sexual relationship. I'm not going to eat certain meats. Because, see, I'm, I'm spiritual. Well, that's not what a Christian is. Well, it's Christian spiritual. But, see, I, I want to be spiritual. Well, you're practicing a doctrine of demons. It's preached by people who have a seared conscience. They don't mind lying when they speak. But you don't fall for it. And Timothy, you remind them. Because doctrine matters with God. And with God's own people. Did you notice what he was nourished in, what he was preaching from? It's the word, it is the faith, it is the sound doctrine. And you will be a good minister when you work from that standpoint. You work from that source and you confront it. And you confront it. But he's a commander, reprover, rebuker, exhorter, reminder, but he's to be an example too. 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter. We come down to verse 11. These things command and teach. He's talking about, here was this doctrine, and he's speaking about you train yourself to be godly and knowing the faithfulness there about the world to come. That's, that's how we were, find ourselves being profitable with godliness. These things command and teach. Then he says, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example to them that believe in word, in manner of life, in love, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give heed to reading, to exhortation, to teaching. See, that's what the preacher is. Exhorter, teacher, evangelist. And so he says, you be an example. That word example in the Greek is not just being an example. 
it is a type. It's kind of something that is set in stone. It is so concrete that it's there to look at. Not going one day and back the next. It's an in-sample in my Bible, not an example. Because that word tupos is being emphasized there. It's a type. It is the epitome of what a Christian ought to be. When young people are saying, don't you despise me. And they're demanding respect. I don't care if they're young. I don't care if they're old. I don't care who they are. When people say, you're going to respect me. We need to come to teach the word of God. Say, I'll tell you what, you earned your respect. And you tell you, I'll tell you, mankind will respect this man. Will respect this type of person. That what they're going to be doing is ne not neglecting Timothy, not neglecting the, the gift that is, that is in him. But he says, you, verse 15, be diligent in these things. Give thyself wholly to them. So you're to be an example in word and manner of life. That means you consider all aspects of your life, your character, your words. Are they truthful? Your words, are they encouraging? Your words, are they corrupt? And your manner of life, how you living? You consider it all. And now you give your all. You give your all. Be diligent in these things. Give thyself wholly to them, Timothy. That thy progress may be manifest unto all. They see the progress. You're being an example in word and in character. In your manner of living. And you're giving yourself wholly to these things. He was to be involved in reading and exhortation. You can't be a preacher if you don't like to read. And the reading was public reading a lot. As, as a part of exhortation and teaching. And you're to be diligent. You're to be busy. We think being diligent is being busy, but it, the word denotes speed. You are running fast to get something done. That's your preacher. And take heed to thyself and to thy teaching. And now you do it always. Continue in these things. For in doing... Thou shalt both save thyself and listen to the power of example and those that hear thee. We heard you, Timothy. We heard you, Commandus. We heard your exhortation. Stinging rebukes. Penetrating reproof. But you're coming from the word of God. But we took it from a man who is unreproachable in his character. Powerful example. And that's what a preacher is. That's what he's supposed to be. And therefore you do that always. And Titus, Titus needed to understand always oh, teaching about different people and their age groups and their relationship to one another. He says, in all things, showing thyself an example, showing thyself to be a type of good works. In thy doctrine, showing uncorruptness. See, we care about doctrine. God's preacher man is supposed to care about doctrine. And sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he who is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of us. So there's that healthy, sound speech. Why? Because he's feeding on the sound doctrine of the word of God. And he's involved in and being an example to that. 
And I think we all realize that when we have people telling us how we're supposed to live, I don't, I don't know how many people do that. Sometimes it may be your parents. But sometimes it doesn't have an impact when we know they're not living that life. We'll call them hypocrites. And we don't want to listen. But it's a powerful thing that you see what one preaches, he teaches. And this was emphasized to both Timothy and it was emphasized to Titus. That you're going to be an example. While you're a commander and a rebuker and an exor exhorter. You're going to be reminding people of things. Oh, things that they might not want to know. But what's going to make it so powerful is that they see you're striving to live it too. Finally, and I think this is important in our day and time. If we're ever going to go to heaven, we're going to have to be fighting a battle. I think sometimes we forget that. We get praised when we become a Christian. We become a child of God. Get a pat on the back. We want this to happen. We've been waiting for you to become a Christian. Joyous occasion. And we can rejoice in the Lord. And we can start living our life. And, and thinking that it, it's all going to be easy. And it's not. Walking the restrictive way of the gospel is not easy. It takes humility. When we sin, we confess and repent and pray. We strive to do better tomorrow. But one of the things that Paul emphasizes to Timothy is that before you ever lay hold on life eternal, you're going to have to be fighting the good fight of faith. That's the order he placed it. Placed it. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12, fight the good of fight of faith, lay hold on the life, which is life eternal, whereunto thou was called and did confess the good confession. I think we just lay hold on life eternal and think that we're not going to have to fight any battles. Why is it called a good fight? Because the evil we're fighting. The doctrine of demons that make men look like they're spiritual giants. And yet they're taking people away from the faith. We're battling Satan. Not flesh and blood. And what makes it a good fight is because we're on the side of God. And it is a battle of the faith. You're going to hold to your teaching. You're going to hold to what you trust in the Lord. When the world is out there, and, and what is the context here? It's money. It's the love of money. I don't care who you are. Money affects you. And it can affect you at different times. We even set up some loopholes where I don't have to take care of my parents. It was given to God, Corbin. And we made it all work out, and everything's okay with us till Jesus came along and taught us the truth. God's demands didn't contradict that. You can take care of your parents. We've seen that in our example tonight, in our passage. We're commanding the children to rise up and take care of their parents. It is a battle. It is a good fight. It is a battle of the faith. And we need to understand we're in a war. Satan would like to destroy us. And he especially would like to destroy the Christians. He's already got the ungodly people. He's already got the guy with a seared conscience. Nothing's going to penetrate him at that time. But here we are, listening to God's word, trying to figure out who a preacher is, and letting the word of God guide us down that road. And we realize we've got to fight a battle. We are in a war. It is a good fight. It is a spiritual warfare. We're bringing thoughts into submission to Jesus Christ, as Paul tells us in Corinthians. We don't use 
the elements of the flesh in order to fight this battle. We use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And we live character. We, character matters. And what happens is sometimes that person sees out there and they don't have anything to say to us. They, they, they call us false. They call us evil. But they change their minds. And that's why we're living. But we're going to have to fight that battle in order to lay hold of eternal life. Who is he talking to here? Well, he's writing to, to Timothy. But thou art, O man of God, flee these things. What things? Material things that grab our attention, that cause people to fall away from the faith because of the love of money. And friend, that wasn't just something that Timothy was involved with. That's something that every Christian was involved with. Did he not tell the rich in verse 19? That when they use their money correctly, they'll be laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on life, which is life indeed. What are they doing? They're laying hold on life. What are they fighting? They're fighting the battle. Sometimes it's a love of money. People don't have anything can have a love of money. A person who has everything can have a love of money. That's the battle of faith. And we're fighting that. Fighting fornication. Fighting taking care of our responsibilities. Living as a slave in the first century. The battle of the faith. And it is a battle we fight. And it's for the Christian. Timothy is just part of the group but you know what makes him a powerful powerful minister because Paul says in chapter 1 and verse 18 this commandment this charge I commit unto thee my child Timothy according to prophecies which led the way to thee that by them thou mayest war the good warfare holding faith and a good conscience. Oh, some have made shipwreck of that. Oh, Timothy, my child in the faith, don't you do that. He didn't say fight the good fight of faith here. He says you war the good warfare. Because he, the preacher, is also a warrior. And what a powerful example that is. For laying hold of eternal life. What a minister that man is. Because he's living it. He's warring that good warfare. As he's preaching to us. And commanding us. And exhorting us. Beware of the money issue. Because we all have to fight that battle. In order to lay hold on eternal life. Tonight he's not just a teacher is he? He's not just out here seeking souls, evangelist. But he's a preacher of the word. He's a commander. Reprover. Rebuker. He's an exhorter. He's a reminder. He's constantly an example. That is deserving of sound doctrine. And he's helping people get to heaven because he's a warrior. He'll deal with the false doctrine. he deal with things that are difficult. Don't talk about money. Don't talk about family. Don't talk about slave issues. Difficult times. But the preacher is on standby. The preacher is always ready. And what gives him the authority is the fact that he is preaching the word. And that's the type of preacher you ought to be looking for when we think about who's going to be our next preacher. This evening, if you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you to become one. Song of the prodigal, of encouraging the prodigal. That's encouraging the person that at one time was in a relationship with the father. But living his profligate life, he wanders away, going his own way, Maybe you'll come to yourself tonight as that man did in Luke 15 and realize that you got a father in heaven 
who's looking for you to come home and to live the life of a Christian that you're supposed to live. Maybe you felt some rebuke and you felt the command of God weighing upon your heart. Not living the way that you should. Change your life. Come back to the Lord. But if you're not a child of God, the gospel is there to save you. We proclaim it. We ring it out to the people who are going to be not prepared for the Lord. Because as we started this morning, to preach the word was introduced by the earnestness. I'm saying this in the sight of God and Christ. It was being earnestly set forth because there's a universal judgment. Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. And when he appears again, there's not going to be any doubt he's king. His glorious appearance is coming. Will you be ready for him? Oh, we want the profligate to come home. But those of you who have never come home, those of you who have always been on the outside, we encourage you to become a Christian. You'll never regret that. Oh, yeah, the life is difficult. But in a congregation that has a local preacher, you know what you ought to be getting and what you deserve. In a church that has elders watching over your soul, they're going to give you some direction. They're going to be there, bring you along as they are shepherds under the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. And those are the things we find in a local church that keeps us safe. Because you know why? The battle is not easy. But it's real. And God has set up certain people in the ministry to try to help you on that route. We've got that at Parkview. Once you become a Christian, become a member of the church here. And we can help you to get to heaven as you will help us as we encourage one another. Come as we stand and as we sing.